Welcome everybody to today's Council on Farm Relations virtual media briefing on the war in Gaza. I'm Carlan Robbins. I'm a senior fellow here at the Council, and I'm also co-host of the Council's The World Next Week podcast. We're very lucky today to be joined by two Council experts. They're very well known to everyone, so I'm just going to give a very brief introduction. Stephen Cook is the Eni Enrico Mate Senior Fellow for Middle East and Africa Studies. He's an expert on Arab and Turkish politics and U.S. Middle East policy, and he's a columnist at Foreign Policy Magazine. He really writes a fantastic column. I recommend it to everyone. And his next book, that's not out yet, right, Steve? Uh, June 3rd. Okay, The End of Ambition, America's Past, Present, and Future in the Middle East. And Elliot Abrams, who will ever be a Central America expert to me, um, is Senior Fellow for Middle Eastern Studies at the Council. He served as Deputy Assistant to the President and Deputy National Security Advisor in the George W. Bush administration, where he oversaw U.S. policy in the Middle East, and a Special Representative for Iran and Venezuela in the Trump administration. And his most recent book is Realism and Democracy, American Foreign Policy After the Arab Spring. So Elliot, Stephen, and I will have a discussion for about 20 minutes, and then we'll open things up for your questions. So we have a split screen right now. We have the Israeli incursion into Rafah. We have the ceasefire talks with Hamas. And we have the Biden administration suddenly pressuring Israel by withholding weapons deliveries. Stephen, can we start with you by talking about the ceasefire talks? Um, White House spokesman John Kirby said yesterday that the talks are in a very delicate state. But he also said there should be no reason why the two sides can't overcome remaining gaps. How close are they, do you think? And how does Rafa affect the negotiations? It's hard to believe that they are as close as the administration has been saying. Um, the people who have they have been whispering to over the last six weeks have been saying that we're very close to a, a ceasefire deal and a hostage deal. But I, it, it's clear that Hamas um, believes that the hostages, at least those that remain alive, are its last bargaining chip and as a result are demanding something that the Israelis can't, given their own politics, their own war goals, are unable to do, which is to suspend their military operations indefinitely. Um, we've tried all kinds of different language formulations for this, but no one has agreed and no one can agree. So um, while I'm sure there is something there that um, CIA Director Bill Burns has to work with, uh, it strikes me that um, given the diametrically posed aims of uh, the two parties, um, Hamas only willing to hand over hostages for an end to the conflict, which essentially means that they win, um, is something that the Israelis can't do. And Hamas can't hand over hostages while the Israelis reserve the right to continue their military operations at some time in the future, presumably sooner rather than later. Um, so uh, I, I think that um, despite what John Kirby has said and others have said, at least from what we know publicly, um, the, the touch points, the things to build on in terms of a ceasefire uh, seem not to be uh, there in the way that official spokesmen um, for the United States, Qatar, Egypt, and even Hamas have suggested. Although, you know, what the Americans say is that, you know, the, they believe that Netanyahu is under a lot of pressure from the domestic Israeli politics to get whatever remaining hostages are alive home, and that that puts him in a certain measure of, of pressure to move forward with, I with think the deal? Are they just sort of whistling past something here? I think that there's, it's undoubtedly the case that Prime Minister Netanyahu has been all kind of under all kinds of cross-cutting political pressures uh, since this began. Um, but uh, while there is a, a very, it's very, very important to Israelis, especially the families of hostages to get, uh, get the hostages back, there is also a fairly large segment of Israeli society that wants to ensure that what happened on October 7th can never happen again. And that means prosecuting the, the, their military operations in Gaza such that Hamas is unable to do it. That has a balance that the Israelis have been trying to maintain. Um, and I think when push comes to shove, um, they are going to um, choose to ensure or do best they can to ensure that Hamas doesn't do this again. There is a there is an intersection here. They have said that military pressure is the best way to uh, get the hostages out. 
perhaps that's the case. But through a negotiated solution that demands the Israelis to withdraw from the Gaza Strip and end the conflict before their military goals are met, I think is not likely um, to be anything that Netanyahu can agree to because in part of his the cross-cutting political pressures that he he confronts. So, Ali, can we let's talk about Rafa, although it's obviously caught mm-hmm. up in the ceasefire negotiations as hostage deal ceasefire negotiations. This isn't the incursion that Netanyahu was talking about. Um, it doesn't appear to be so far. And uh, after ordering at least 100,000 Palestinians to evacuate from eastern parts of the city, conducting airstrikes, the IDF took control of the Gaza side of the Rafa border crossing with Egypt on Tuesday. The Israelis are insisting that this is so far just a limited operation and not the full assault that Washington was was warning against. How do you read the Israeli strategy? Do you expect them to stop with this or is the larger assault still to come? You wrote in Foreign mm-hmm. Affairs last month that Rafa is the key to both winning in Gaza and deterring Iran. Mm-hmm. Do you think that this is just the first step and they're just trying to calm the Americans down or is, or is, is this really they're just sort of testing right now or what's the game? I think they're doing two things here. Uh, their view, as Stephen said, is that the only way to get the hostages out is to put significant military pressure on Hamas, on Sinwar. And they're beginning to put more of that pressure on. Uh, they're also responding to that attack a few days ago by Hamas uh, at Kerem Shalom, at that crossing. So this is a response to that. And it is, let's say, laying the foundation for going in on the ground. And it is a message to Simwar, I think, that, yes, we're all listening to Joe Biden. But let me tell you something. We are going to go in. We're going to get you. So they think that the only thing that will actually make uh, Hamas agree to a reasonable deal from the Israeli point of view is the thought that in three days or eight days or 18 days, the IDF could be in Rafah, and that would be the end of Hamas. Uh, I think there's a very broad consensus, at least in the um, security establishment in Israel, uh, that they need to go into Rafah unless there is a deal. The deal that Sinwar offered uh, the last few days is Uh, not acceptable to the Israelis. Um, And I think that is what has led now to the beginning of what could be a large incursion. I think what will be a large incursion into Rafah, unless there's a deal. The State Department spokesman said that with a great deal of, you're hearing from Washington, of course, you know, a great deal of frustration. I don't know if they're more frustration than I think we've heard up until now. that they haven't heard a plan for protecting civilians in Rafa. Um, and Stephen, do the Israelis have a plan to protect civilians? I mean, certainly they've opened, reopened one of the crossings, but you know, Rafa was a pretty important you know, crossing for getting things in. I mean, both the Israelis say for getting weapons in, but also, I mean, is there a plan for protecting civilians here? Or is this just going to make the misery there infinitely more miserable? Well, there's no question about that if there is a large military operation that unfolds, that there will be a lot of misery and a lot of bloodshed and, and difficult times ahead. The Israelis insist that they have a plan and that they've begun to implement it by calling for the evacuation of civilians in eastern Gaza to an an area close to uh, the Mediterranean that has been uh, a safe area. We know um, that there is really no place in Gaza that is genuinely safe and people are getting killed no, no matter what. And these are the unfortunate things that happen during wartime. So there is no foolproof plan. There's also the administration has made it very, very clear over and over again that they don't support a Rafa operation. Um, yet the Israelis seem intent on having a rough operation. It would seem to me that it, it would be politically expedient for the administration to say, we haven't seen a good plan. We haven't seen a good plan, um, even as the Israelis prepare to undertake one because um, they know they know it's coming and they can't stop it. Um, so, look, it, it, this it, it's no doubt that 
um, a rough operation is is difficult. It's complex. Uh, this is an area of Gaza that normally has 275,000 to 300,000 inhabitants that now has 1.2 million inhabitants. Um, it is uh, extremely, it's extremely difficult. And, you know, uh, the Israelis uh, say that they are going to take care, but they have, um, uh, there have been lots of casualties and they do have a goal of rooting out those Hamas battalions. There's there's no foolproof way that they are going to be able to protect, uh, protect civilians. I just want to add one more thing to that, Carla, which is Rafa is, of course, on the Egyptian border. In 2005, when the Israelis got out, uh, Sharon had to make the decision. It was a hard decision whether to try to keep troops along that border to prevent smuggling. And in the end, he decided uh, not to. Um, and the Israelis are now, in a sense, revisiting that decision. And one of the things they're doing by putting uh, the troops in Rafah is they're taking, if you will, the Gaza side of the Egypt-Gaza border so that whatever happens uh, in the next couple of months, uh, they will know that they're in charge of preventing smuggling themselves in the long run. One of the big complaints from the Biden administration is that it, for all the commitments about getting humanitarian aid in, um, that they're, the aid isn't going in, not at the levels that you know that keep pledging that's going to happen. Um, certainly, this is making the situation infinitely more miserable. Can we, Elliot, and then on to Stephen, can we talk about the state of U.S.-Israel relations right now? We've learned in the last few days that the Biden administration which has been trying simultaneously to help midwife a ceasefire agreement. Um, it's also for the first time held up weapon shipments to Israel. Uh, Lloyd Austin confirmed that today. It was quite clear that it, it is directly linked to what's going on in Rafah. The Times reported it paused deliveries of 3,500 bombs. The Journal a few days earlier reported that the administration was delaying the sale of JDMs, you know, these guidance kits that turn dumb bombs into smarter bombs. Um, is this a, a significant break or something temporary? And what is the administration asking for, do you think, Elliot? I think what they're asking for uh, is for Israel not to go into Rafah in a, in a significant way. And uh, barring a deal, barring a hostage deal, um, I think the Israelis are going to go into Rafah and it is going to cause a great deal of tension. I, personally, I think one of the things the administration is forgetting is that there's a very big audience here. The audience is not just a Netanyahu. The audience is also Ukrainians and Taiwanese and Saudis and Emiratis and Russians. And they're seeing the Americans when a friend, partner, ally is at war withholding ammunition. It makes people think about the slow way in which we gave ammunition to Ukraine. And I think the administration is not really focused enough, in my opinion, um, on the deleterious impact of doing that on a whole uh, panoply of relationships that we have. Now, how angry people are or are not, <clears throat> I think is difficult to judge because as Steve said, both Netanyahu and Biden are thinking about politics and about elections. And both are addressing different parts of their own constituencies. So whether in private um, with, let's say, Blinken or Sullivan or Burns or Austin, um, there really are hard feelings. I think it's very hard to tell. You know, I, I, I'm the moderator, but I'm, I'm going <laughs> to... I'm going to challenge this for one moment. I, I don't see the comparison with Ukraine. I mean, Ukraine was a result of fecklessness on the Hill in politics. I mean, conditioning aid um, rather than giving a blank check, if you find that an ally is doing something that you particularly find noxious, really in the humanitarian realm as well. I mean, we don't, we're not required to give a blank check to our allies. And I don't, I don't see the Ukraine thing as, as particularly analogous. Stephen, do you see this? Do you see this I, analogous? I, I, and do you see this as a moment of, of break? Let me give Elliot a chance to respond because I know he wants to respond to you. And then I, just, I, I have uh, some thoughts on this as well. You're obviously right about the part of this that is Congress. But it was not Congress. It was the president who decided 
to withhold certain weapons completely. And then six months later to say, well, okay. Okay. It is the president who's saying, we're not going to give you anything that could hit Russia. And now you have some of the Europeans, the British saying, well, maybe we will. So I do think there was a lot of this was decision making on the part of the United States about what we wanted an ally to do while it is at war. That's the analogy. Nice. OK, the self-deterrence part of it. OK, Stephen, please. Uh, I, I I think it's clear that there's a lot of tension between the administration, if not the president and, and Netanyahu, although we keep getting reports of it and so on and so forth. I think the I think there's an important thing to understand that the relationship at an institutional level continues to work, whatever hard feelings there there may be. And you you see the frustration among senior officials um, and uh, at lower levels um where people are very unhappy with the policy and the tension over the humanitarian issue is is abundantly abundantly clear part of this is i think the the administration is trying to have you know two things at the same time one give the israelis as much support as as they feel is necessary while at the same time being pressured politically to do something on the on the humanitarian humanitarian front from constituencies in uh in in the united states not that this isn't the right thing to do but the president didn't get concerned about this until well down the road while this this was already this was already unfolding um i think two two quick things um perhaps carla you're right elliot's uh ukraine analogy isn't the best but if you are saudi if you're emirati uh and you're looking at this situation and you say you must be saying oh my god if they can do this to the Israelis of all people, given the way in which you know the leaders in these countries look at the U.S.-Israel relationship in the middle of a fight that the Israelis consider to be uh, an existential one, uh, we can only imagine what they could do to us in the middle in in the middle of a fight. And in fact, they have a narrative that the United States has been enormously feckless. Um, whether it's the JCPOA, whether it's 2019 when Iran attacked Saudi Arabia, the United States didn't do anything about it. The Houthis dropping uh, missiles on Abu Dhabi and, and Dubai and the United States not doing anything about it. Um, this does is this does have an impact uh, on them uh, when they look at it. And which is one of the reasons why the Saudis very much say, OK, we will we will get in. We will get in line with you. But we want it in writing. That's what part of this defense, this demand for a defense pact actually is. So this kind of thing doesn't happen to them should they get into a fight as hard as that might be to imagine. There's another so, point that I want to make. There's another point that I want to make that I think it's a hard point and it's 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 difficult to contemplate, but in particular, the holding up of the JDAMs may result in more civilian casualties. Um, the Israelis are not going to stop their operations because the administration has put a hold on these things. So if you, without these kits that lessen the likelihood that more people civilians in the way will get killed more people are going to get killed it's somewhat short-sighted to to prove a political point that's not going to have the impact on the ground that it is it's going to satisfy the administration democratic senators members of the house um people who are have been protesting against israel momentarily but it's not going to do much to save lives of Palestinians. And I think that that, and, and, and not to say that these precision guided kits will save everybody, but there there is something to be said here. It's a difficult thing to, to contemplate. But um, I think in, in trying to make this political point, uh, the administration is being somewhat short-sighted. So we have more than a hundred people on, and I'm sure they have a lot of questions. So please raise your hand. And when you get called on, please identify who you are, which would be great. Um, so questions, we have one. Um, Amer Madani, could you identify yourself, please, and ask your question? Hello, uh, it's Amer from uh, the Associated Press. Thanks uh, for doing the call. Uh, and I apologize, I missed the first couple of minutes. You might have touched on this, um, but what what happens to the biden Bibi relationship if Israel moves forward with this major incursion in Rafa? And I guess more broadly, um, the two leaders, as I, I think you've already touched on a little bit, there's really divergent political pressures. 
Is this relationship now at a point of rupture or is this just another sort of wave in what's been an up and down relationship for years now? Thanks. I'd say it it, um, it won't rupture. These things uh, happen. Uh, I remember uh, President George W. Bush, for example, really didn't get along with French President Jacques Chirac. They could barely speak. So business was done at the National Security Advisor level, Secretary of State level. Um, there are always workarounds <clears throat> if the heads of government are really don't really don't get along. We may get to that, but of course, this may be uh, a sort of a problem that solves itself in that one or both of them may be gone from office in six months. Well, nine months. Uh, you know, I. I don't know. I don't I don't know either of them. I, I've met each of them once exactly. Um, and so who knows what the quality of the relationship is? I think only people who are close to both under understand that. I, I do think, though, in, in getting at something that Elliot is suggesting is that the U.S. Israel relationship has become so institutionalized that you can that it can work at other levels, despite the fact that two leaders can't stand to be in the same room with each other. We saw that with George H.W. Bush and Yitzhak Shamir. Uh, we saw that with, uh, with Barack Obama and Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, and we may get there with, with, uh, with President Biden, but, but the relationship is deep at the institutional level. So there are still ways to, to, to conduct business. All that being said, I think the politics of the U.S. Israel relationship in the United States is changing. Um, and I think that you see that, um, in sharp relief in the kind of open discussions within the Democratic Party about conditioning aid to Israel, cutting off aid to Israel, sanctioning uh, people uh, in Israel. There was a poll last spring that struck me as the first time that more Democrats than um, identified with the Palestinian cause and with the Israelis. Um, of course, you have on the Republican side, you don't really have those changes. But I think that there has been, um, uh, and, and, and this conflict has, has really brought it into sharp relief, that there is a changing dynamic, at least in within one of the political parties, on the question of uh, the, the overall relationship, despite the fact that in Congress, you still have lopsided votes in favor of support for Israel um, on, a, on a variety of issues. But there is certainly um, a, a greater willingness to really air these uh, kinds of concerns in ways uh, and talk about policies or look for policies um, that, um, for lack of a more diplomatic word, that are punitive um, towards uh, the Israelis. Ellen, and I apologize, is it Jonas? I'm probably mispronouncing your name. Can um, can you uh, correctly pronounce your last name and tell us your affiliation? Yeah, it's Ionis, um, but I'll kind of take anything. I know that there are a lot of vowels in there. <laughs> um, I'm with Vox with a V, not Fox with an F. Um, and that's, I bet that's more important than the way people pronounce your last name. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I do. I have to clarify both. So I already have my script set. Um, but so we do have a report coming from the administration um, in the next couple of days, maybe today, um, about whether the Israel has violated international law in terms of um, its airstrikes and and access to aid. But does that really have any effect on uh, what goes what you know U.S. policy is toward Israel going forward? You know how binding do y'all perceive that to be? Uh, I think we are at a kind of turning point here in a, in a significant way in the U.S.-Israel relationship in that the formula for decades has been Israel has to be able to defend itself by itself. And the Israelis have talked about that. And, you know, whenever we do a, a joint statement, going back decades, they insist on putting in defend itself by itself. But what we saw in the Iranian attack is that Israel wasn't defending itself by itself. When we talk about Israel possibly in a war with Hezbollah, same thing. And even now, as we discuss uh, merely the provision of JDAMs or uh, different sizes of bombs, we're talking about Israel not being able to defend itself by itself. That's a big change, I think, in the relationship. It's going to have to be worked out over uh, the next years and the next um, presidency. And I think it makes these decisions 
on withholding um, arms, ammunition, weapons, uh, much more significant than they would have been a few years ago, because the, the context now is one in which Israel's security is more clearly dependent on the U.S. than it has ever been before. Can you talk about that a little bit more? Because, I mean, we used to talk about, well, the Israelis couldn't sustain, you know, launch or sustain a campaign against Iran without American support. Um, uh, they didn't have the legs for it. You know, they couldn't, they couldn't do that. They didn't probably have the heavy, you know, heavy weapons to, to, to go after the deeply buried, buried sites. Are you saying that even in a campaign against Hamas or Hezbollah, the Israelis can't do it themselves if the Americans were to suspend weapons deliveries? At a certain point, uh, well, we, we, we all uh, can think of 1973 and the resupply by, uh, by Nixon. Um, I think the resupply question in in any extended combat, and this is the most extended combat Israel's ever been in. I mean, most of the mo the Lebanon War, for example, the last Lebanon War, two thousand six, was thirty four days, and people thought that was long. Um, the Israelis are reacting to this in part uh, by doing something that we're also doing, which is um, they're going to build up the, their capacity to produce their own weapons their own artillery shells, their own bombs, uh, just as NATO and, and we are doing. But some things uh, they need tomorrow morning. And there are some things that they'll never produce, like F-35s. So I think it's clearer now than it has been at least since 1973 that uh, the, the uh, arms relationship with the United States is critical to their security. And if there were a war with Hezbollah, you'd see that, I think, very quickly. Well, let me just strike a somewhat different tone on this question and then go back to Ellen's originally, original question. First, a couple of things should be clear. Um, it, it, we wouldn't be in this situation had there not been a leadership failure in the months leading up to October 7th. It, you know, we, we know that that there were analysts who understood what, what was going to happen. So I think the Israelis have all of the necessary things to defend themselves. Elliot's making a very good point is that the IDF is now engaged in a doctrine busting, doctrine busting conflict. Israelis have always sought to fight short, devastating conflicts on their enemy's territories. Going on eight months of conflict, the IDF just isn't built for that. And what I would say is it's not so much that the United States, it's not so much that we've said that an Elliot, of course, was a policymaker, but and there were certain things that were said. But over the course of a period of time, it became clear that the policy was to help Israel secure itself um, so that these, so we would help, we would provide them the means, help provide them the means to defend them, to defend themselves. And I think that what's happening is consistent with that policy over a period of time. But I agree with Elliot that the idea of um, withholding aid. I mean, there were there were moments during the siege of Beirut where President Reagan did did certain things, but this seems to be. And going back to Ellen's original question, this national security memo, which I don't truly understand the rationale for it. I mean, we we do have allegedly these safeguards with regard to how countries to which we sell weaponry use them. Uh, we've never actually, with any country, actually used those uh, authorities or withheld aid unless, uh, unless there's some situation that I'm unaware of that was an extreme circumstance. Um, so I think that this was an effort on the part of some members of Congress to highlight this issue, accentuate this issue, put pressure on the administration uh, on this issue. I will say, though, that the um, the the impact of it is likely to be not great. I, I, again, I, I think conditioning aid, I, I, the Israelis will scour the earth for the last bullet to shoot at Yahya Sinwar if necessary, or they will produce it themselves. And you can expect now that the Israelis to revisit their defense industrial base and becoming more self-sufficient. This happened with Turkey after the block, uh, after 1974, uh, when they invaded Cyprus and we laid on a blockade. And it's been a long-term goal of the Turks, particularly under the current government, 
to develop a defense industrial base where they don't have to be relying on the United States, the Germans and others. They can build their own drones, their own munitions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Expect that to happen uh, in Israel as well now. And when and then we will have really no control, no influence over what they're doing. Although one might argue we haven't had much influence anyway, but with that thought. Well, Trudy, we, we may have chosen not to have that influence, Tr which Trudy is the Rubin. same thing. Trudy Rubin. Hi, hi Trudy. Dude. Hi to all. Um, the Israel-Gaza war has taken a lot of the air out of focus on uh, Ukraine, even though Congress finally passed the supplemental six months late. Uh, Ukraine's in a critical situation now, and the U.S. is sending stuff to Israel uh, <laughs> that Ukraine desperately needs. And meantime, Israel has Patriot systems in mothballs, but there doesn't seem to be any way to transfer them directly or indirectly to Ukraine. So my question is, which do you think is the more critical uh, conflict for U.S. security? And if the U.S. doesn't muster a greater sense of urgency, especially before November elections, to enable the Ukrainians uh, to use long-range uh, missiles and uh, air defenses and put Putin off balance this year, not in 2025, as Jake Sullivan says, um, Ukraine could be in a terrible situation which would have a much bigger effect on our security interests globally if Putin wins than whether or not we condition a few weapons to Israel. So I'm curious from both of you, which is the more important war for America's security interests? And should there be more focus right now on Ukraine mm -hmm. rather than Bill Burns and uh, uh, Tony Blinken spending all of their life and few remaining non-gray hairs running around the Middle East. Okay, let, just uh, let me, Trudy Rubin writes the worldview col column for, for the Philadelphia Inquirer, just to, for context here. <laughs> Elliot, you want to take that first? Do you want me to go? Yeah, who, well, who wants to play Solomon here? <laughs> I guess I'd say two things. One, in the short run this year, next year, <clears throat> uh, the collapse of Ukraine under, let's say, under Russian domination, <clears throat> would have greater implications for Europe and for the United States. In the long run, however, the collapse of the American position in the Middle East would also have a significant impact. What is happening, I think, in Gaza is part of an Iranian effort in Yemen, in Syria, in Iraq, in Lebanon, <clears throat> to dominate the region and to surround Israel. <clears throat> so um, it is also of... Uh, <clears throat> Of considerable significance, but I don't. I don't see truly that we need to choose. I mean, it's one thing to choose between a war with Russia and a war with China. We're not in a war with either of them. We're just helping people who are friends and partners of ours, and resupplying them. And I, I don't think we're going to find ourselves unable to do both at the same time. I, I think I'd answer two different ways, Trudy. First, um, I'd say that. You know, October, November, I would say to you, uh, certainly Ukraine, um, that this is what's happening in the Middle East is a is a conflict. It's a it's a bigger, but it's a conflict that is familiar to us. Whereas we're talking about the first land war in Europe since the end of World War Two, the entire we a, a core interest, global interest of the United States is a Europe that is free, whole and prosperous, whatever that whatever that saying is. But. Elliot points to something that is, I think, very, very important, that there is now a nexus of Iranian, the exercise of Iranian power, uh, combined with the Russians. There's a closer relationship between Russia and Iran and cooperation. Those same drones that were shot at Israel were shot, are the ones that are being used in Ukraine. Uh, let's also remember the fact that China is deeply invested in the Islamic Republic. Um, primarily because it extracts uh, resources from it, but it is important. So this is so 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 these are um, 
our core interests in um, free free flow of energy resources out of the Middle East, helping to ensure Israeli security and European security are all engaged in these two conflicts. Now, you raise an important point. Why do Israelis have patriots in storage when the uh, when the uh, Ukrainians really need them? If I were an Israeli national security decision maker, I would, given what has just happened with the Iranians a few weeks ago, hoard everything I could. But why do the Cypriots need air defense systems? Why do the Greeks need old Russian uh, S-300 systems that can easily be integrated into the uh, Ukrainian arsenal in ways that the Patriots cannot. So there is ways that we can help replace what the Cypriots and the Greeks have so that they give to Ukraine. And they are more directly affected by that conflict, given that they're both members of the European Union, than they are by the conflict. So it's not, yes, it seems obscene that the Israelis are hoarding these things, but they're now engaged in a conflict in which the Iranians have demonstrated they were not successful, but a willingness to attack the Israeli homeland with their sophisticated missile and drone program. Can we talk a little bit about, if I didn't know this about the Cypriots, I'm fascinated now, but can we talk a little bit about Israeli politics? Um, sort of the conventional wisdom is that, you know, BB will do anything he can to you know stay in power and stay out of jail. Um, so... How much how much room does Bibi have to maneuver either in ceasefire negotiations and in the proportion of his incursion in Rafa, um, given the right wing of his coalition? Could can he make another coalition, particularly given the pressure that he's feeling from the United States right now? He Jump can't off. make a whole new coalition, but he can make some decisions that will um, alienate the far right there, uh, Ben Gvir, Smotrich, because the opposition leader, Lapid, has said, we'll hold up the government, we'll support the government for those decisions. For example, a deal, let's say, a hostage deal. Um, so he's got, he does have some wiggle room. I think that that what is underestimated by a lot of people in the US is the degree of consensus. And I think there's a view that, you know, BB falls tomorrow, Benny Gantz becomes prime minister and the world changes, but the world doesn't change. You know, he's Benny Gantz spent his entire career in the IDF. And uh, I think we would find him on Gaza in general, uh, uh, not so different. It is President Herzog, the former leader of the Labor Party, who said, don't talk to us about the two state solution right now. So I think uh, there is, a pretty broad consensus now that does that does give BB um, a fair amount of wiggle room. Um, again, it, it not to create a new coalition. He's not going to, I think, create a new government, but to hang on for a while more during the war. Let me let me just say, uh, Elliot knows far more about Israeli pol domestic politics than I do. But so, just watching what. Is happening in Washington and what people are saying. I, I've dubbed it the other BDS, the, the BD derangement syndrome, um, to watch members of Congress on Sunday morning news programs tee off on Netanyahu on this question of, you know, Palestinian state, revitalized Palestinian authority, a Rafa operation. You know, there is broad consensus. Two thirds of the Israeli public support a Rafah operation. Two thirds of the Israeli public oppose the idea of a two state uh, solution. Benny Gantz it ran to the right of Netanyahu on Gaza. Benny Gantz has questioned why the Israelis are allowing humanitarian aid into, uh, into the Gaza Strip. I, I think that when it comes to Netanyahu in particular, people forget um, politics and that there has been a rally around, if not Netanyahu, a rally around the flag in Israel. And there is a genuine belief that Israel's military goals are achievable, even if, you know, pundits and members of Congress don't believe that that is uh, that that is the case. There's another problem, I think, in 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 Washington is that wa people in Washington tend to know certain people. And I think that there's a half of Israel that people don't know. People don't know Bezalel Smotrich. People don't know Itamar Ben Gavir, who command what, 50 percent combined or some significant number of Israelis. 
Um, and we don't know that. We we our interlocutors are are different, um, and so therefore uh, we don't understand that part of Israeli society. So it leads to these kinds of bad misreads uh, of what's happening. That it's all Bibi's fault, and that Bibi's only doing these things to stay in power. Now, undoubtedly, it's the case that Prime Minister Netanyahu would like to remain in power, like all politicians. He would undoubtedly because he would like to remain out of jail. And there are certain cynical things that he is doing that um, is not unheard of for other politicians to do to remain office and remain out of the clutches of a, a legal system. So um, I, I think it's important to have a, a more realistic view of what's happening in Israel than it's all Netanyahu's fault. Arshad Mohammed, can you identify yourself and ask your question? Sorry, Arshad Mohammed, uh, reporter with Reuters. Um, we're all aware of the reports of the administration seeking to um, come up with a, a civil nuclear deal with the Saudis, um, negotiating some possible security guarantee with the Saudis, um, devising some formulation that would be acceptable to the Saudis and presumably to. Hey, Arshad, could you speak more directly into your mic? I'm starting to lose you. Hey, I'm so sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah, now I can hear you much better. Thank you. Great. Do you need me to repeat all that? No. I think okay. keep, just keep going. <laughs> okay. Um, some formulation on a pathway to a Palestinian state that would be acceptable to the Saudis and also to an Israeli government, and then Saudi Israeli normalization. And the fundamental question that I have is it, it seems as if the number of dominoes that would have to fall to bring this about is many miles long. Why is the administration trying to do all this if it seems so very unlikely to come to pass? What, what is the theory behind this? Can I take that since I was recently in uh, Saudi Arabia? So, um, yeah. First of all, I said, uh, hey, how are you? Um, to uh, check out my new foreign policy column, which which posted today, which is exactly on 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 this issue, um, I think that it, it is basically unrealistic to believe that they are going to bank shot all of this. Um, I don't know, uh, based on what I hear from from Saudis and what we know about Israeli policy, there is no touch point on a Palestinian state. By the way, an issue that the United States urged on the Saudis um, that the drafts of texts of this broad agreement were different and then were changed not long after October 7th and the administration started getting on its footing and thinking more about day after scenarios and, and resolving the, the conflict. The Saudis didn't demand a uh, time limited, serious pathway to a Palestinian state, which uh, sounds a lot like Oslo. Um, so it seems to me that the administration is keeping this alive because this is their signature policy in the region, no longer JC re entering JCPOA. The new thing is we're going to have this security pact that, um, helps us and outmaneuver the Chinese in the region, um, and, and, uh, expands the Abraham Accords in ways, um, that are, I think, very, very important. But there's no there's there, there's no way at this point that the Israelis are going to agree to the time limited, serious process that leads to a Palestinian state. And at this point, the administration has told the Saudis that's basically what their requirement is. Now, I'm not saying the Saudis aren't concerned about the Palestinians. The Saudis do say very much that they support a, a Palestinian state. But they remain interested in normalization. Um, and so in theory, this could happen. But on the ground, the reality is, is that it, it doesn't seem likely to happen. In addition to the fact that this is now Washington politics, if even before October 7th, it was going to be a heavy lift to get center, the requisite number of senators to sign off on the defense, the American defense of Saudi Arabia after October 7th, it, it's going to be even harder because Israel was supposed to be the sweetener of the deal. And now there's a fair number of members of Congress who want to penalize the Israelis for the way in which they've conducted the war. Fair or not, it doesn't seem like there's enough votes. I don't know who in the White House is counting the votes. 
So why no. pursue it? I mean, there's no, there's no point in having a signature policy. Why, you know, why pursue this if its odds are so slim? Elliot, do you have a view? I would we, just say- um, We have just to wrap up, Elliot, really quick. Okay, very quickly. I think the nuclear part of the deal, U.S.-Saudi, is almost done. I think the U.S.-Saudi treaty idea is almost done. I agree with Steve. The problem is the Palestinian state idea. And what's so bizarre is that it isn't a Saudi problem. It's a Washington problem. We are more Catholic than the Pope on this one. Carly, you're world's muted. great. World, <laughs> I'm not muted. Now world's great. World's, world's great religions all brought together in one place. <laughs> so, I want to thank Elliot Abrams. I want to thank Stephen Cook. I want to thank all the questioners. And I want to thank CFR for bringing us together. Um, video for this is, will be posted on CFR.org. More resources, I'm told to say this, are available on CFR.org and foreignaffairs.com. And thank you, everyone, for today. So Thanks, everybody. Until next See time. You. Bye. Thanks, Carla. Thanks, Elliot.